crowd tonight. And uh, just a couple seats open and thank the Lord for that. And uh, we don't know what kind of crowd will be on the other side of the camera. So uh, we're thankful for that as well. And I just uh, am thankful that we have a church that loves the gospel and have a church that when the gospel goes out over the air like this does, we know somebody can hear it, understand it, and get saved. And I've always preached that way. I felt with someone, I don't care how many degrees you have, if somebody doesn't understand it, it's not worth a hoot. That's right. No. And, uh, you know, and I, I tried. I, I really felt the Lord led me to do that, to do the degree work that I needed to do. But, uh, you know, it wasn't for flaunting it. It wasn't for, but I just felt God wanted. And if God wants you to do something, you better do it. You know, whatever the cost whatever the cost. And I always found when I followed the Lord that he opened doors. You ever find that? When you do it his way, he opens doors. And so uh, I'm glad you're here tonight. And uh, uh, let's ask the Lord's blessing on our service. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for loving us for seeing way through the eons of time that we would be saved and we would be your children, that we might know you and love you and serve you. And Lord, I pray tonight that we might be encouraged from an Old Testament saint who loved you, who didn't have near the knowledge that we have but he did see you and talk to you personally. And Lord, we know we do that, but not really face to face. We know as we think when we get to heaven, we will see you for the first time, but we will have known you for a long time. And so we thank you, Lord, for your, your, your grace, your goodness, we thank you, Lord, as we're going through these sections of Romans now, where we've moved from Paul showing that we're all sinners, we're all lost, we're all in need of salvation, to these passages where he speaks of salvation, justification, that we might come to you and know you, that we might get your righteousness, and Lord, what a trade, you take our sin. And so thank you for that, Lord. Bless your word to not let your spirit run free. And we ask that hearts be touched, lives be changed, and that we might serve you better. In Christ's name, amen. amen. All right. Uh, would you believe uh, we start chapter four tonight and uh, we're in our 27th lesson. And so we're moving right along uh, at uh, breakneck speed. So, and I figured that. Uh, I know that the book of Romans is so full. It is so full of what we need today, you know. Uh, we look back and we see the different things that go on throughout history and there were terrible times. Uh, I really believe that most of us here tonight maybe, and I hope not, maybe have lived through the best of America. Yeah. And that uh, those that are going to be here the next few years, if it goes the way it's going, it's going to be rough sledding for Christians. We've gone from being a people who were respected in many places admired uh, to being people that uh, are looked at with a funny stare these days. And so, uh, uh, but I hope that doesn't scare you away. Uh, they said a lot of bad things about my savior. And uh, uh, he was victorious. He was victorious. And, 
and and uh, when you think about it, our end is a good end. Uh, whether we we leave here uh, by the rapture or we leave here by death, uh, absent from the body is present with the Lord. Amen. And so, uh, and the rapture will be instantaneous. The dead in Christ, those before us, will rise from the grave, get their new bodies, and in a twinkling of an eye, I don't know if that's one one hundred thousandths of a second, it's pretty darn quick, uh, that uh, we're going to follow them. And uh, we will receive as we go on up our new bodies. I believe that. Um, I believe that uh, we will have new bodies and they will be like what God wanted for Adam and Eve. Uh, but these, uh, there will be no more sin once we're there. And our old nature will be ripped out of those new bodies that will never be there. And the old nature will die with this body if you're alive for the rapture. And so I'm thankful that I met Jesus one day, aren't you? Amen. And uh, I want to get about our lesson tonight. Uh, we've really got a jam packed. That's why I'm not showing you anything from last week. Uh, my question is, what about Abraham? Did you ever hear that question? Somebody's talking about somebody, and, and then you can always think of somebody that's worse, right? Or some other problem. And uh, my question was, what about Abraham? What about Abraham? And uh, Paul almost says that. Go to chapter 4. We're going to look at the first five verses. And it says uh, in the scripture, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? In fact, Abraham was justified. What if Abraham, in fact, was justified by work? He had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credit to him for righteousness. Now, to the one who works wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. You work for an employer, you expect what? A paycheck at the end of the week, and when you get that check, you say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Matter of fact, uh, most of you say, I think I should earn more. <laughs> and so, uh, and then it ends up in five. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. And so, what is this testimony? As he brings Abraham up here for a reason. He says, what shall we say? In other words, my question, what about Abraham? What about Abraham? And so as, uh, as we look at this, uh, we're going to be looking at, uh, at scripture here uh, throughout uh, uh, this time. And, uh, we're gonna we're gonna cover really a lot of verses tonight, and so uh, we're gonna we're gonna move uh, probably as fast as we can. Uh, we're gonna uh, in our study. Our first thing is uh, what was Abraham's testimony, and I want you to look in uh, Genesis uh, uh, twelve, Genesis twelve. And uh, uh, there, verses one through four. And uh, as you're getting there, I'm going to start reading. The Lord has said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, your father's household, to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great. Then you will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse you. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went, as the Lord told him. Lot went with him. Abraham was about 75 years old. 
when he set out from Haran. Now, what did I get out of those verses I just read? And these you can put in underneath there, right small. I have a lot that he said in there. Matter of fact, I have nine things that you can write in there. See if you can get them all in. Uh, the Lord spoke to Abraham, and number one, he told him to go, and he would guide him. Told him to go. Number two, he told him he had a place for him to go. He, he already had designated it, so he told him to go. He said, I know where you're going. He told him that he would make him a great nation. Make him a great nation. He told him that he would make his name great. A great name. Great nation, a great name. Told him he would make him a blessing. A blessing. I often think, I hope I'm a blessing once in a while to somebody, don't you? What, what do you think? Uh, do, you, do you hope that for yourself? Mm -hmm. That you hope that sometimes you're a blessing. Uh, he told him he would bless those that blessed him. He told him that he would curse those that cursed him. I'd say it's probably not good to be on the wrong side of Abraham. He told him he would make all peoples of the earth blessed through him. And then finally, number nine, Abraham believed God and he left Haran at the age of 75. Just a mere spring chicken about uh, our age or right in it for most of us. We got a few young guys here, like Gary, All right. and uh, but uh, uh, Jim over there. But you know, you think about that. He was in our thinking. You don't start a new adventure when you're what seventy-five. That that was you know. You think about that. Uh, well, I think I'm going to start, you know, a new career and become a millionaire, and I'm 80 years old. And most of you would look at me and say, boy, that poor fool. <laughs> you know, but uh, he was going to live a long time yet. God was going to give him a long life. And so uh, what was his testimony? Well, all those things I read to you, uh, were part of that testimony, but that's not the end of it. That was that was just the first part there. That was Genesis 12, 1 through 4. We're going to look now at uh, Genesis 17, uh, 1 through 7. 17, uh, 1 through 7. Let me get there. And uh, in 17, 1 through 7. Uh, this says, when Abraham was 99, now he's 99 years old, 24 years later, uh, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am I'm God Almighty, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and I will greatly increase your numbers. Now, uh, he doesn't have a son yet that's blood <coughs> He has a son, but it's through a slave. And I'll make a covenant, he says, between me and you will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be a father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abraham, and uh, that means uh, exalted father, a or Abram. No longer will you be called Abram. Uh, it says you won't be called that anymore. But he said, now you're going to be called what? Abraham. You know, every time I see Abram, I just read Abraham. I, I, it's an awful habit. But, uh, and I want you to know something. 
Uh, not every name in the Bible means something, but when God changes the name, it means something. Right? Uh, I saw a, a scholar that I deeply in, enjoyed reading, and I, I was a little bit saddened by what he did with the chapter out of the Old Testament, where he pulled a few names, and there were many names, and told the whole story there about what those names meant and made that chapter sound like it was something. When I really looked through it, I said, boy, there's a whole bunch of other names there. Why those few you picked and then said, that's what it means. But uh, he, he was really a, a great scholar and it shocked me and there's people that did that, people who work with numbers and numerology and all that in the Bible and come up with this secret or that secret. And some who try to find in every name a reason. Don't do that. Don't do that. It is true that names mean something in the Bible, but not every name means something for that situation. But uh, here his name was changed to Abraham. Now, Abraham means father of many. He, was, he went from being exalted father to father of many. Uh, so, uh, it says, for I have made you father of many nations. And that's the idea behind it. And I will make you very fruitful And he goes on with that, uh, uh, that he said, uh, I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting cover covenant. Uh, how long is that? So this Abrahamic covenant is how long? God's promise to Abraham was what? Forever, eternal. And so I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me, who's me? God, and you, and your descendants. And that's why I always say when people try to take Israel out of the picture, God says, and your descendants. Jewish people today are still under your descendants. Now, I know we are spiritually part, we're going to see that a little bit later on, of Abraham, a spiritual side. But I'm talking about the physical people who came down through the lines of Abraham there, and that's what that means. So I'll establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants. And so, uh, uh, and uh, this one, uh, I don't have nine thoughts out of it, but I do have seven. Uh, so, uh, if uh, you got your pen ready, uh, seven thoughts out of Genesis 17, one through seven. And uh, this is, this is uh, as you look at this, uh, this is what happened to him at 99 years of age. The other was 75. The Lord spoke to him and said, he was the Almighty. He wanted him, number two, to live a faithful and a blameless life. Now, that should be what we try to live, amen? Amen. Yeah. A, 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 a faithful and a blameless life. Now these all come out of those, those uh, uh, one through seven verses. That he's the Almighty, that he wants him, that God wants Abraham to be faithful and blameless. Uh, we read that Abraham fell on his face before God. Uh, this was an encounter with God. Uh, you can well bet you get in front of God, where are you going to be? Uh, yeah, you're, you're, you'll be on your, on your face. 
uh, many who met angels were on their face, weren't they? Yeah. Uh, I believe angels probably are uh, maybe eight, nine, ten feet tall. Uh, because uh, some believe that uh, when it says the sons of God cohabit with the sons of women, that it was angels. And out of that race, there were what? Giants. 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 Uh, you know, and you read about uh, some of those that uh, during David's day that were around that were between 10 and 12 feet tall. <clears throat> some of them were higher than the ceiling here. How'd you like to meet that guy in the alley? <laughs> huh? Basketball would be real easy for them. <laughs> In fact, uh, they, they didn't reach up for the hoop, they reached down. <laughs> and so, uh, it said Abraham, of course, in awe of God, he fell on his face. And uh, I think we take God way too lightly today. Yeah. Right, right, Pastor? Yeah, that's right. I got two pastors sitting, look at me here. Uh, we take God often too lightly, just another friend. I'm glad he is my friend. But he's a whole heck of a lot more than that. Uh, God said to him, I'll make you a father of many nations. So uh, that's number five. Number six, your name will be changed from what? Abram, exalted father, to Abraham, father of men father of many and I'm collecting your papers tonight just to see how you do so sign your names <laughs> oh I see some of you suddenly picked up a pen <laughs> and number seven I will be the God of your descendants uh I had an uncle on my wife's side who was a pastor and uh, he was of the, the thought, and that was very popular many years ago, uh, and many very good professors and others, they were on millennialists, and so they get rid of the, uh, the tribulation and the millennium, and uh, the millennium they talk away and said all that's happened through history. I'm really studying it all don't see that that happened in history. That that happened in history. I'm a, I'm a pre-tribulationist. And uh, I believe the tribulation is still coming. Sure. And I believe that, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, he, he was a pastor and his brothers were not pastors. One owned a restaurant train, a chain. Uh, another one was a farmer. And uh, he, he, during the time we'd get together, particularly when my brother-in-law and I were there, because he knew we were two pastors, uh, he would, he, here's, here's a statement, he'd do that every time we met. And, uh, you know, Israel doesn't have a future. He would do that every time. And what he would want, he loved nothing more than debate. Now, in these days we live, we can't debate anymore. Uh, the guy will pull out his gun and shoot you. you, you I mean, when I went to college, uh, you know, I went to a Wesleyan Methodist uh, college for my undergraduate work. And uh, we had, I had many discussions because I was a Baptist in a, a Wesleyan Methodist school. And we would disagree and uh, walk away friends. And uh, we could go through subjects and, and uh, be several hours that we would be uh, talking this one and that one and voices might have got a little, but when they left, they hugged you and uh, uh, next day uh, you were right about your business. And I'm sad for the way things are today. Yeah. I am sad the way they are today. But uh, here again is that promise he gave to Abraham uh, there's a class I go to where uh, the teacher is on ill, And uh, he knows that I'm pre-trib. 
but the guy is a great teacher and you know the uh, thought about what the prophecies are don't change whether we're going to heaven he, he has the rest of the doctrine down salvation and uh, sanctification and and uh, we sit and uh, we talk over things and very few things other than when he says well I'm on mail and I believe this but uh, when he's just teaching uh, you you wouldn't know unless he someday said that that he wasn't a straight pre-trip. Uh, his theology is dead on, and I have said that to him and to the class that when we meet. And uh, when he's gone, he lets me teach. And so uh, uh, I said, we don't spend, you'll notice that we don't spend a lot of time to the men that were there debating because the soteriology and and the the rest of it he has is is on, and his prophetic view and my prophetic view are different. And all he can say is, "We'll we'll know someday." Amen. Right. See, prophecy is prophecy, and it's going to happen. Right. But salvation and all those things are dead on. And so, uh, as we look at this. So far, we've seen, uh, you know, when I asked, what about Abraham? We've looked at Genesis 12. We've looked at Genesis 17. And finally, uh, probably the biggest one in Abraham's life. And you can guess where I'm going. Genesis 22. Genesis 22. And uh, I am not going to read all of that, but... Uh, uh, go, turn with me to Genesis 22. And why I'm not going to read it all is that it's 17 verses. And I think you'd like to get out of here before 8. <laughs> we, we have... Uh, let me get rid of that. We have here, it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham and said to him, well, Let me change this so she can't do that. Got a lady that's next door neighbor who was persistent. <laughs> and she's going to say, I didn't answer her phone call. And that's true. <laughs> Uh, it says sometime later God tested Abraham and said to Abraham uh, called him out and uh, Abraham said here am I he replied then God said take your son your only son whom you love Isaac no uh, this is an Ishmael this is Isaac uh, the only son through his bloodline uh, or, and through his wives and uh, he told them he said uh, uh, I could that uh, let me get to it here and it says that uh, he was going to take them to well my phone won't, won't go down let me do this I think it's my neighbor <laughs> uh then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Uh, all of you have had children, how easy would that be? Most of us would have said no to God. We said, you know, uh, I'm not going to do this. But I want you to notice this guy. And I'm just going to read another couple verses. Uh, he didn't ask for three months extension, a year's extension. Notice what verse 3 says. The next day, 
Early the next morning. When did he obey God's command? Immediately. Immediately. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. Uh, when they had cut enough wood for a burnt offering, he set out for the place God told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And he says to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there and we will worship and listen to this phrase. We will worship and then we, we will come back to you. Uh, awful hard to have that happen when you are going to offer your son as a burnt offering. Burnt offering means you destroy the body. You burn it up. And I believe that Abraham believed that even if God had had him go through it and he would have set his son on fire, I believe the faith of Abraham because he said to him, through Isaac, your descendants will come that he believed somehow God would resurrect him and the two of them would walk off the mountain. Because he said, Isaac and I will see you when we're done. Wow. And he didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and Acts. Or all of Paul's epistles. or all the Old Testament that we have even now put together. He was a man of great faith. He was gonna go up and do it. And so I'm gonna give you the thoughts from that one. I know there's 17 verses. I don't have 17 thoughts. And you say, praise the Lord. <laughs> Uh, so far we've seen what's happened to Abraham when he was 75, when he was 99. Now we're going to see God test Abraham uh, when uh, he probably was maybe about 115. Isaac was old enough to carry wood and uh, he was a teenager. Uh, we know that when he was 100, Isaac was born. Amen. Yeah. At 100, Isaac was born. Isaac was now big enough that he could carry a load of wood up the hill. And so, you know, I, I don't have an exact date, but I guess he's, you know, 15 to 17 years old at this time. And, uh, uh, and a young enough buck and strong enough that he probably could have taken his old father in a moment. But I want you to see what happened. When this is Abraham and his faithfulness, God tests Abraham's faithfulness. That's the thought here in 22, 1 through 17. Number one, God, God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, verses 1 and 2. And then number two, Abraham obeys God's command. How quickly? Immediately, and I just put that all together. That was three through ten, and that was their journey there. And uh, and by the way, uh, Isaac asked him. He said, uh, "Dad, where's the sacrifice?" And an interesting verse in there. And God will provide Himself a sacrifice. Wow. Yeah. Did you hear what I said? Yep. The reading should be that way, and God will provide himself a sacrifice. And he did. For you and me and all the world. So they go up, and they get to the top of the mountain, uh, and uh, as we look at those verses, the three through 10, and uh, uh, they prepare, this place where they're going to 
uh, do the offering. And Abraham asked Isaac, he binds him, and uh, while he's laying on the altar, and Isaac allows him. I had an author one time I thought was real cruel about Isaac. He said, uh, all I can say about him is he had a, a great father and a great son. And that's all I'm going to say about Isaac. I don't think he has looked at this and realized that a normal young man, when his dad's 115 and he's maybe 15, would say, look, old man, you sacrifice something else, I'm walking down this mountain. <laughs> You have lost it, Dad. I'm not going to do it. But I think he was more than this author gave him. Because yeah. he laid down there and let his dad put a knife over him. I think he was more than we think. That he had more faith. And we know that Abraham raised the knife. I just want to say this. I know it says there that God says, now I see that you will be faithful. Did God not know that before that? Yes. Absolutely. And so you say to yourself, well, what was it for? He knew Abraham was going to do this. He knew Abraham was going to do this. It was for you and me. It was for all of us that we might see a testimony of a father and son that were obedient to death like his son would be. Yeah. And, and so the testimony was for us on the other side. My God knows everything's going to happen the rest of your life. For some of that, that's not as long as it's been. But uh, when we look at this, God doesn't need to see anything because he's already in tomorrow and he's in the tomorrow after that and he's in the future 10,000 years, 10 million years, 10 million years. Time is no stress to God. Our God is from beginning to end in all in all time he's in all place yeah and he's all powerful but let me get back to this stop ranting and raving so god uh, asked abraham to sacrifice isaac abraham obeys the command immediately and goes up to the mountain uh, an angel, and in verses 11 and 12, an angel of the Lord speaks to Abraham. Uh, and it says, the angel of the Lord. Uh, a ram is caught in the bushes, 13, 14, and uh, is sacrificed, and Abraham calls the place, the place where God will provide. So uh, that's, that's what that place is called God will provide the place where God will provide and then in 15 uh, the angel uh, of the Lord speaks the second time and says to Abraham and uh, in uh, number 6 uh, and that's verse 16 God blessed Abraham and his descendants and then 17 through Abraham's descendants, all the world will be blessed. Again, the reinforcement of that prophecy. And, uh, and like I said, I believe that no matter what you think, that the Jewish nation still has an earthly promise to who they are. And so... And the question is here, 
was Abraham justified by works? And uh, uh, just a few thoughts on that. In, in Romans there uh, and I, I divided this up as you can see verses 2 and 4 uh, verses 2 and 4 uh, go together verses 2 and 4 God said take your son your own oh well, let me get back to Romans here quickly Uh, verses 2 and 4 I'm going to read together if in fact Abraham was justified by works he had something to boast about but not before God now to the one who works that's verse 4 wages are not as credited as a gift but as an obligation and so when we see this uh, the Gentiles who were not seeking righteousness uh, were granted, it says, granted it by the grace through faith. They did not work for it, and they did not earn it. And Paul had to go back and say, don't add to them the Jewish laws. They added some things for them to do to be faithful in certain areas, but uh, uh, not as far as many of the Jewish regulations. And so uh, as you look at this, uh, he said, as you look at this, Gentiles, as I said, who were not seeking righteousness were granted it by grace through faith. They did not work for it or earn it. But Israel missed it by seeking righteousness through what? Works. Works. Through the law. They stumbled over the Messiah. That's a thought that's here in this reading that I, they stumbled over the Messiah and did not believe in him. Jesus himself, as you read some places there where there was a stone of stumbling, that stone was Jesus. And it was a stone of stumbling for the Israelites. And it says that this stone, if they fell on it, it would pierce them. And if they got under it, it would crush them. And so someday I'll tell you what an interesting thought I have about what that stone looked like. That could pierce you as well as crush you. And, uh, but uh, was the stone. Uh, Paul says that why it was such an offense when Moses was going through the wilderness and he was to strike the stone one time and water came out, right? Is that the story? And then what was he supposed to do from then on? Speak to the rock. And the promise was what? When you speak to the rock, water will come. Well, one day Moses, his temper was really up in high gear. And Israel had pushed him about this far. You know, his boiling point was over his eyes. His eyes were bloodshed and his face was getting red. And he walked up to the rock and he struck it. He struck it. Bang! Bang! And water came out. <coughs> But as a result of that, he didn't go in the Holy Land. And you say, boy, that's what in the world? He hits an old rock and God won't let him go into the Holy Land. What are you talking about, man? <laughs> that rock was the stone. Paul says in Corinthians, that stone was Jesus Christ. Yeah. The water of life. Yeah. Amen. And he could only be crucified once. Right? And when he struck it a second time and a third time, it was like re-crucifying Christ fresh and anew, and it can't happen. Yeah. And it kept him out of the Holy Land. Yeah. 
God took him up on Mount Moriah and he looked over the land. God said to God said to Moses, Good night. He died and got buried. Only only person, now that's pretty good being pretty close to God too, when God buries you. Yeah. And uh, you'll have to figure out why God buried Moses. Why did God bury Moses? You think on it. And so, uh, was he justified by works in verses 2 and 4? No. And then verses 3 and 5, let me read those together. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. However, to the one who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as what? Righteousness. So two and four go together and three and five go together. Was he justified by faith? And uh, as we look at this, uh, this is a thought out of the uh, Christian Standard Bible that I thought was kind of neat. Gentiles who were not seeking righteousness were granted it by grace through faith. They did not work for it or earn it. But Israel missed it by seeking righteousness through law and by their works. They stumbled again over the Messiah and did not believe in him. And you have Isaiah 8, 14, Isaiah 28, 16. And Jesus himself warned Israel that they missed the stone. They missed the stone of stone. Matthew 21, 42 through 44. And then you go back to Psalm 1, 18, 22 through 23. That talk about the stone. And so as you look tonight in the word of God, I pray that you will realize that if you're trying to work your way to heaven, you have failed. Yeah. In fact, you've failed miserably. For salvation is only by grace through faith. And it's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. A gift of God. I thought this was a neat little lesson. Amen. Uh, illustration used from the patriarch. And uh, I'm amazed at how faithful he was. How faithful he was. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for meeting with us tonight again here at Midway Baptist. We ask that you would bless us and be with us. Thank you for this good crowd out tonight and for the blessings you are to us. I'm thankful, Lord, for everyone that's sitting before me tonight who has received you by grace through faith and that not of themselves. They have trusted in you and believed in you. And by faith, they have received you as their Savior. Lord, I pray that any who listen to this message that don't know Jesus and are trying to work their way there, that you will speak to them tonight and help them to realize that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, and he's the only way to the Father. Lord, bless our message, bless our folks, bless each one of us. Be with our pastor who is out tonight. And we just ask your blessing on this group in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.